Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Did you ride your bike? No. <laughs> I, I, I won't get into why. <laughs> but I won't get this afternoon. Can you bring me down just a little bit? You give me too much sound and I'll have it. You know, I'll think I'm someone real important. <laughs> so do the United Women of Faith have an announcement to make? Are you the United Methodist Women of Faith who are here, or are they, did you want to sleep later this morning? <laughs> here, give me this mic. Um, yeah, this past week we've been setting up for three days at least, and selling for two days, and then yesterday a good share of what was left went out free to the community, um, and we still between the sale itself and the things that LaBelle I know she's not here, um, that LaBelle sold online, we have made over $3,400. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and we have eight or ten women and a couple of men that um, were here most of those seven, six days. I don't know, I'm still rummy. Um, and that count, by the way, is done while I'm tired at night, so we'll see what the credit union says tomorrow. <laughs> So I, I noticed that we left the couch in the sanctuary. Are you trying to send me a message? Like, my messages are, you know, my message, you need a couch. My message regarding that is I was too tired to stay. I'm and joking I you. I'm joking you. I, I thought maybe it was because sometimes during worship people want now. We have a meeting um, after worship uh, for um, the excuse me the uh, gay Medford Gay Pride event uh, in June. We'll have a table, so uh, if you'd like to be part of that meeting, <coughs> we'll just meet right after worship at the library just to do some planning. Are there other announcements? For the good of the community? <coughs> Well, good to have you here this morning, Lauren. I'm a little, feel a little thrown off. We didn't have any visitors until about five minutes ago, so we got it together. I mean, I couldn't even print up my message, so kind of crazy, right? The world we live in. Sure, service. Yeah. What, what was that? Sure. Sure, service. I don't know how to take that now. All right, so let's have a prayer. We'll send ourselves for worship.
rise. Come to me, all who sit in darkness, into the shadow of death. And on you the light has shown. For Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And this is the story. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness could not really out. Amen. And we'll join in singing an Easter song.
We recently have had the bell refurbished, and we're going to have a bell choir concert at four. And also, I was actually speaking to someone from a small congregation um, last night, and uh, they were really excited about singing. So we have a really good program on um, Sunday at four, four o'clock. A week from today. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't come today at four. All right. Let's uh, set for ourselves. Uh, with Bill uh, McDonald uh, last night, 
Lake City. Bill, former, for those who don't know, a former pastor here, really well loved. He, he's near the end of life. He's really not eating, drinking, but uh, kind of resting easy. And Cindy has been with her. So keep sending your prayers. She's been spending some nights there to be with her. Right. Are there others? Are there people, other places that you want to pray for? I've got a note here from Bobby. Oh, yeah, right. I'll mention that. It's a good idea. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> Mother's Day, you're a good one. <laughs> I did have a good mom. She loved me well, very strong will. You didn't mess with her. <laughs> you grew, up to, grew up in Brooklyn, New York. You just did not mess with my mother. She's a good woman though. She'd fight for you if you loved you. <laughs> yes, we women and men like that in the world. Are there other prayer requests? Yes? Don? Yeah, we have a good family friend in Honolulu after a series of grand ball seizures is in the hospital in a coma with a breathing tube, not like a girl. A classmate of our daughter, Cynthia. Thank you. Okay, so a classmate of yours, Cynthia. Uh, Dean Shepard. Dean Shepard. He's very sick and in Honolulu. Sounds like he's very ill. Yes, Brisa. Two people. Kathy Oberlin has a very bad cold. She just can't seem to get Oh, right. Yeah, yeah she's been sick. Kathy Oberlin, right? Right, and then also her very much loved one and ex mother in law who's 97 has breast cancer fell recently. Okay, and, and her, her mother in law fell has cancer. Yeah. All right. Are there others? Yes, hey. I have a kid traveling. You have a kid traveling. <laughs> well, they are. I want to be your kid, you know, and be a global trial. You went to? He went to my sister-in-law's funeral in college. So you've had a sister-in-law die? Yeah. He saw him say. Okay. All right. Yeah, Jamie? Yeah, I just want everybody to keep Chuck Jones in their thoughts and prayers. We'll keep Chuck in our prayers. Uh, with the gun violence going on in our country, 116 mass shootings in less than 120 days, I just wish that we could all calm down and practice. Jamie is saying all the gun violence in the in the country and around. Yeah, it's very, very exciting. Very exciting. Sarah, we can do better. Sarah Matt. Sarah, Sarah, thank you. Sarah Matichuk has her surgery this week, and I know uh, we have folks that are bringing her meals. Sarah Matichuk is a young mom in the church who's got uh, breast cancer. Well, let's pray. Um, our response, Lord, look upon us. And let us show forth your glory. Lord God, all power in heaven and earth belongs to you. Shield us in times of distress and danger. Protect us from all that is evil and destructive. Renew us and refresh us. Renew us and refresh us. And in doing, help us to proclaim your mercy and goodness with our lives. Lord, look upon us and let us show the Lord for the glory of Lord. We pray for the leaders of the nations, especially for our elected officials. For those who are given authority to make decisions that affect our communities and our lives. They would work for a more peaceful, merciful, just society. And that the welfare, at least among us, would be forefront to their minds. Lord, look upon us. And let us show forth your glory. For communities that have suffered from natural disaster, for those who have lost homes, livelihoods, loved ones, may your church be among them working for their recovery and wholeness. Lord, look upon us. Amen. Let us show the Lord in our glory. For communities that have not been devastated by gun violence, for those places that we gather, parks and schools, houses of worship, markets, 
the offices where we work. Show us how to get to that place where we can be safe once again and at peace. God, as you call us to guide us in our journey. We pray for those who are burdened with hardship. For the refugees along our southern border, for those who have fled, fled their homeland because of danger and hunger. Give us wisdom. Help us to work together. We pray for those who battle addictions and desire release. For those who have adequate shelter and desire a home. The poorest of our city who find themselves trapped in poverty. Lord, look upon us and let us show the world your glory. For those in our circle of care, for those loved ones whose welfare is heavy on our hearts, we pray for the chronically ill and those who care for them. For those that live, we know well with emotional pain that they would find healing any that are near the end of life, that you would open up your kingdom, your case of love to them. And we thank you for the daily joys of friendship, and good food, and babies, and sparkling older adults. Give you thanks for the beauty of the nature that surrounds us this time of year. Lord, look upon us and let us show forth the fruit. And for this congregation, guide us in the ways that lead to truth and life for ourselves and our community. Give us hope, give us laughter, give us courage as we do your work in this world. And we pray the prayer that you taught us. Our Creator in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us bread for our needs from day to day. And forgive us our offenses as we have forgiven our offenses. And do not let us enter into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We continue to um, reach out to the community. We are a busy place uh, throughout the week, and it's a joy to come here during the week uh, for those who are just needing, I don't know, some food or a warm smile. Let us continue to support the church. Let us pray. Lord, bless these gifts that you are to receive, that through them your word would be proclaimed and your good news announced. Amen. Thank you, ushers. Thank you, Lord.
the plates up on the table? I guess not. <laughs> I'll talk to them ahead of time. No, no, don't, don't worry about it now. No, no, no. She said, don't worry about it. We'll get them next time. I was thinking, you know, bring them up to the table. Offer them. It's okay. It's okay. I'll take them. I mean, I won't take it. <laughs> Um, Linda, you know, I asked the, come on up. <laughs> I'll shake your hand. <laughs> I asked uh, during the um, rum sale who would want to read the scripture on Sunday, and I know that a lot of the people were thinking, oh, I have to come here on Sunday too. <laughs> I'm so tired. <laughs> I know you are pushed. You are tired. Do you have to cook for a road retreat tomorrow evening? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well. But I can make Ken do most of it. You can make your husband do most yeah. of it. I think yeah. I would. Just yeah. put your feet up and give him directions. Yeah. <laughs> like always. Like always. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I just barely made it, you know. I just barely made oh, it. Oh, we'll do this to the prayer first. Thank you. Prepare our hearts, O oh God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voices but your own, so that we may hear your word and also do it through Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm glad you're here. We'll make it worth your while. All right. Uh, Luke 6, 17 through 19. He came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And they came to hear him to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And everyone in the crowd was trying to touch him, for the power came out from him and healed all of them. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 26. This is a fascinating chapter in the Bible. Now, if if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We, even, we are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are all of we are all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ, but each in its own under each in its own order. Christ, the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when, his hands, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. The word of God, the people of God, thanks be to God. Let us join in singing uh, uh, him, Charles Wesley wrote the lyrics here, the words. We can remain seated.
small crowd, guys. You're singing okay. Good job. Good job. Not too, not too shabby. For if we're this like only we have hope in Christ, we are all people to be pitied. Let's pray. Man, you know great harm today, although I'm just some small good. You know, I, I, I told this story before, but I can't pass it up because it fits so well into this Corinthian passage about resurrection. So, bear with me if I'm repeating, which I am. I, I was um, visiting with my father in his old age, and um, it was the evening. I recall it was even, you know, cold New Hampshire night. Um, and we were watching the television feeling relaxed and at ease, and he turned to me and he asked, so, so Ben, uh, do you actually believe in the resurrection? Now, before I want to continue telling you the conversation, it would be helpful to know that my, my father was not a believer, not at real, didn't seem at all. Sometimes he would say to me, on a good day I'm agnostic, but I don't have any good days. So, there we are. Uh, for many years, he, he struggled um, with, what, with what he called my career choice. And, you know, it was never anything that, honestly, hurt the relationship. I just knew who he was. And I would remind him, well, Dad, it wasn't a career choice. It's called a calling. And then he would just shake his head and say, well, son, you know, you're fairly intelligent. You could get a good job. He would say to me. <laughs> He wanted me to make money. Um, he was young during the Great Depression and knew the hardships from living in a northern mill town in New Hampshire. And it affected his understanding of success and of life. And he, he would do financially fairly well. And he wanted that you know, for his son. And so for years, you know, he would send me job opportunities in the mail with his hands crawl and say, how about this? <laughs> and I would, I would remind him, Dad, I'm not looking for a career change. <laughs> Do you actually believe in the best direction? He asked me on that evening. And I said, well, um, if you're asking me if I think Jesus was raised, yeah, 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 I do. And then uh, I, there was a long pause, and he said, well, I suppose if you're going to continue with your career choice, you ought to. So, that's what he said. We, we never argued about Christian faith for the resurrection. Uh, we, we didn't try to talk one another into our way of thinking because we knew it wouldn't, that wouldn't change the mind of either of us. And I, I do believe that belief comes when the Holy Spirit moves within us. And, and, and it should be said that um, uh, my father wasn't asking me this question to, to needle me or to pester me. He really wanted to know, because he really wasn't that way. He was not a pestering type. He really wanted to know what I believed. And when I said, yes, I do believe in the resurrection, I actually think he felt good about that. Because his thinking, if I was going to continue to lead congregations, to him, you know, it seemed rather pointless that I didn't buy into the end of the story. You know, if you're going to do this, well, take the whole story, right? Otherwise, you know, what was I there to offer? We, you know, the victory has been won. Christ has conquered sin and death. Christ has conquered sin and death. That's a lot, goes a lot further than patting your um, parishioner on the shoulder and saying, good job, better luck next time. If there is a next time, you know, or, um, you know, like, uh, go at it, give it a try. So, that's where Paul's coming from when he says, if there's no resurrection, we are most to be pitied. Because there are less stressful ways to live. <laughs> there are less stressful ways to make a living. Like sell life insurance, another option he gave me. Because at least that way, in the end, when calamity happened, they could actually get something, right? Why the sacrifice? I could hear my father saying, Well, if you don't believe in the resurrection, um, you should have paid attention to me, taken one of those other job opportunities. <laughs> if Christ has not been raised, Paul said, your faith is still. 
For Paul, St. Paul, without the resurrection, he, he, he really felt we had nothing. And I, I do think my dad would agree on that, even though he wasn't part of the faith. If Jesus wasn't raised, then why in heaven's name would we call him Lord? Why, why would I call him Lord? If he's not been raised, then I do struggle with it. He's not been raised, and why call him Savior? What is he saving you from? Why put your trust in his grace? There have been other great teachers in human history, Plato, Aristotle, Moses, Muhammad, Buddha, Gandhi, and their faithful followers don't call them Lord once they've died. They don't speak of a, a saving grace. And it's also true that in the ancient world, while Israel was under Roman occupation, there were a lot of people who claimed men who claimed to be messiahs, rulers that would liberate them. And yet, we have this meager peasant that lived 2,000 years ago. Like, after he died, we felt compelled to still follow him, to talk about, you know, salvation saving of the world and our souls. But what happens without resurrection? Once again, Paul says, you know, there's not a resurrection, and you're doing all this, you are most to be pitied. The Easter, folks, is how it all began. That's why it began. It didn't begin because of Christmas. Easter, folks, is what makes Christmas mean something. It's why Christmas is a 50-day season. I mean, excuse me, Easter is a 50-day season, and Christmas is less than two weeks. Did you pay attention to the hymn we sang? That Charles Wesley hymn? Hail the day that sees him rise, alleluia, to this throne above the skies, alleluia. Christ a while unto mortals give, Alleluia. We sense his native heaven, Alleluia. Why would you sing that? Why, why would we sing that? And I know it's a struggle of faith for many, but why would we sing that without resurrection? Yeah, indeed, I want to say this. It's a great comfort to know that Christ suffers for the world. There's no place that we can go that God has not been and not been there. That is part of the point of the cross. On it, we recall Christ feels abandoned. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that is a common human experience. I can't tell you how many hospital rooms I've been in or accidents I've been here where folks felt forsaken or the person battling with mental illness or battling with addiction. They can tell you what it feel, means to feel abandoned. Well, Jesus goes with us to that misery and resides with us there. In the older version of the Apostles' Creed, that statement of faith that's been around you know, for what seems like forever, old statement, the original lines read, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried, then he descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again. He descended into hell. Well, can you think of a worse hell than a crucifixion? Point being that there is no place that we can go that God cannot be there with us, even hell itself. But on the other side of us, if he just stays there with us and doesn't raise us up, well, you know, sooner or later I'd like to get out of hell, even if I like the company. Mm -hmm. Right? Right? We are most to be pitied. That's simply shared misery, which goes a long way, but that's not the, hopefully, the end of the story. If Jesus does not pull us up out of the fears and the inner struggles that we have, the sins that we have, the obsessions, the addictions, then he still blames us. I, received, I remember receiving a phone call 
from a grammar school principal. Not longer, not long after the courts had overturned busing in Charlotte, North Carolina, which was a very segregated city. And that busing issue was huge. And when it was overturned and they no longer going to have um, busing, that meant the poor schools were going to stay poor, the wealthy schools would stay wealthy, black schools would stay black, white schools would stay white. There was no community mix. So I got a call from a grammar school principal on the other side of the city, not too far away from me, who said to me, can you partner with my school? Because if all I got were poor kids, there's nobody to pull us up. That's, if, if everybody is, is in poverty, they don't see anything else. But they need a role model. They need other directions to go. Yeah, so if Jesus just stays on that cross, all right, then where do we go? It's important to note that when Paul is writing this letter to Corinth, he's not trying to prove the resurrection. He's not, he's actually not arguing the case, I don't think. This is not a, a passive of apologetics. He's not, he's not trying to, he's not trying to strong arm us into this. No, not at all. What he's doing is he's saying the resurrection is the starting point. It's actually the place we begin. That's where we, that's where we, that's where we launch off. For, 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 for Paul, the resurrection is as, as real as a spring, and it's as indispensable as God's love for the world. It's, for him, it wasn't a question that there was a resurrection, the resurrection, but why there was a resurrection. And the answer to that question has everything to do with the future. Like, will evil be overcome? Will the earth and heaven be restored. Later in that passage, we didn't continue to read because I felt like it was long enough, but later he writes, then comes the end when he's talking about a series of events. When he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. That last enemy to be destroyed is death. God has put all things in subjection, under, in, in subjection under his feet. Now, I know that can sound fire and brimstone. It can sign, cat sign, Old Testament. It can sound like judgment, the word subjection. But, but the point is, is that the resurrection is the end of the story. It's for you and me. It's for all created order. And sin, this fear that we live with, that it is a stubborn opponent. But it's no match for Easter Sunday, for the cross, for the resurrection. So where, where do you take this certainty from Paul, the resurrection? Let's be honest. Church is a place where we're supposed to tell the truth. Resurrection is a huge leap in faith. In some days, it's difficult to hold on to. Years ago, I had a, a faithful leader in a congregation. He, 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 he was a great, good leader. And he said he didn't like Easter Sunday. He said because you can't escape the idea of resurrection on that Sunday. And he said, I can't make myself believe in that. And so, it's all there after him for Easter. He, he just, you know, would just do it. I responded by telling him that despite the fact that I'm a spiritual leader of the community, there are days when I struggle with it as well. But what we have is each other. And there are times when we need to carry one another spiritually and believe for one another when it's difficult for us to believe for ourselves. To have someone who can hope for us when we feel like we're up against a dead end. I find it interesting that 
Paul, St. Paul, always closes his letters to the Corinthians with litanies of prayers and instructions on how to encourage one another. He says things like, at the end of this letter, keep alert, stand firm in your faith, be courageous, be strong, let all that you have done be do, done in love. And that's what he's doing. He is encouraging his congregation to have faith, to encourage one another to have faith, to have this hope when they can't seem to have it for themselves. And I have seen this very often in congregations. Years ago, I recall an elderly woman thanking me on the way out of church for caring and praying for her son. And she wasn't just thanking me, she was thanking the congregation. I was the proxy when she was speaking to me. She had come into town to check on her son, who had started attending our church for about a year at that time, had gotten involved in the congregation. And she, she had been carrying a heavy burden for him, for her child. When Charlie showed up at our doors on his motorcycle, he, he, he was a broken man. He had been beaten, beaten down by life. He was discouraged. But he wanted to take his life back. And in time, he put aside his heavy drinking. I remember I once went to visit him, and he had this flashing neon Bud Light sign um, when I went into his yard. And he kind of, he pulled the plug on it. I thought, hey, that's fine, that's okay. But this time, he found meaningful work. He started delivering oxygen, administering oxygen to homebound people and patient people. He had found a community. And it would be fair to say that he really had come back to life. We saw it in him, in his appearance, and just in the color of his complexion and his eyes. But he wasn't going to get there until the congregation carried him and believed for him, until he could believe for himself. And that's very much what resurrection is like. That's why we have a community, to help us along that way in that belief, in that hope, in that hope. We, we are a program to focus on problems and crisis. Our, our attention is drawn to the latest shooting, and we need to be aware of that. But that attraction to fear, to danger, you know, that comes from that reptilian brain, that early, early part of the brain that was there in the beginning to help us survive. But we can train our hearts and minds to see resurrection, to see it taking place. Sometimes we have to point to it for one another. Sometimes when we can't pray for ourselves, we just pray for that person until they can come to that place. Yeah, I think that, um, I hope I did this for my father. Do you believe in the resurrection? He asked me. And I said yes. He has some serious doubts. But through that father and son relationship, I think I did one thing good. I think I did believe and pray for him so that perhaps he could come to a point where he could pray and believe for himself. So I wasn't too surprised that when he died, he asked his preacher son to do his funeral, the Christian minister, <laughs> who just didn't want to change his career. <laughs> So I did, and we celebrated the life and resurrection. Amen. Amen. So I know it's not Father's Day, but I did talk about moms too, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that lady, I do remember her, she was a short woman came through. She was just so happy her son had come back to life. So let's join in singing.
know that a good God watches over us. Jesus walks beside us. And the Holy Spirit is within us. Let's say amen. 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 Happy Mother's Day, moms. Happy Grandmas. <laughs>